why don't we at this time uh, go to God into prayer for Marvin, for the family, uh, and uh, just for our time together as a church. Uh, Father, we, um, we thank you that you are God and we are not, and that we don't have to understand different things. We don't have to understand the timing of when you call different people home, uh, where, how, when, uh, but that we can ultimately trust in your sovereignty and all that you do. Uh, Father, we do want to thank you for uh, the privilege that we have had as the Cape Town Church to know a, uh, such a feisty woman as Linda, uh, full of faith, full of feistiness for you, for your purposes. As far as she has served her family, uh, both immediate and extended family in this church in such tremendous ways. And I pray that uh, you'll be with uh, Marvin that's left behind other family members as they uh, grieve, as they prepare this week for the funeral, as they go through different up and down emotions themselves. Uh, I do pray for us uh, as a congregation that will give us wisdom as to how we can be most supportive uh, to them uh, in this time of loss. For we also pray for others that have lost loved ones, for Gustav that lost his father recently. Uh, father, and no matter... Uh, how, how old someone is when they pass, it remains a tremendous loss for those that uh, stay behind. So please give him and his brothers comfort uh, and anyone else for that we might not even be aware of. I know that a girl also lost a sister. I heard about that recently, Father, for that loss for their family uh, as they nav navigate this difficult time. Father, then I also want to pray for this morning, for me with faith, uh, insight, uh, the words to say uh, that will be most helpful for us as we uh, desire to build a better tomorrow. For we love you. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so where's my remote? <clears throat> uh, we are talking about building a, a better uh, tomorrow as a congregation, that we want to always see uh, a better future and what that better future will look like. And in context of what we've been speaking about for a long time, the story of the Bible is to build a garden-like community, an Eden-like community. What was lost in Eden uh, and in many ways brought back to be restored as we'll continue to look at through Jesus. As so we want to build a, a community of people that would have a divine union uh, with uh, the Trinity, uh, interact with the Trinity, uh, be filled uh, with the, the Spirit as we make our world better here that we do not just look to a forward future of one day new creation, uh, but that we realize that new creation can take place here now because of Jesus, and it can happen in me, in you, in me, through you, uh, and collectively as a congregation. But there's always, like with anything, with any family or any scenario, there's hopes and dreams, uh, but then we also need to set certain things in place that will increase the likelihood from our side as to uh, this kind of community uh, transpiring amongst us. Now, <clears throat> what I want to preference this, for this lesson, and most probably forever, till Jesus comes back, is uh, uh, the, the, this is my take on things. Okay, so again, what I shared last week, some of it is definitely biblical, scriptural, clear. Others is experience as to what you see happening, uh, what you see happening could be, or what could be helpful, uh, but it's not saying that everything that I'm sharing as to the principles that I think will help us as a congregation, it's not saying, thus says the Lord, okay? It's saying, hey, thus says a fair amount of watching <laughs> and seeing things play out and that uh, what is helpful today might be helpful tomorrow or not. We need to keep on being uh, nimble uh, as we grow and change. But so, uh, what we have seen so far, obviously, is that Paul said that uh, we must watch how we build. Uh, do not build with wood or straw, but build with costly stones, and we must build on a foundation that is already laid, uh, which is Jesus Christ, and everything that he has brought about uh, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Again, we'll take a look at that more in the future. Uh, then, <clears throat> with Jesus Christ as the foundation, uh, what we do have, and I've loosely spoken about it in the story of the Bible, is that being made in the image of God, each of us, that would mean if we're made in the image of God, we have divine DNA inside of us. Now, that's a freaky concept to think of, okay? But, and we'll maybe in the future do a whole series on that. That's why we never get anywhere, <laughs> if you wondered. 
<clears throat> okay, because there's, there's just new avenues and things that one can continue to unpack and explore. But uh, one of the things we looked at in the story of the Bible is that when God made everything, He said that was good. Uh, made mankind, it's very good. And that we live in a society where there's uh, where through history and tradition, the idea of total depravity, uh, that you're actually evil uh, by nature, uh, uh, is built. Uh, and yet that's not what we read in the Scriptures, God made what was good. And that in the rebellion in Genesis 3, there was rebellion and a fallout, but the humankind didn't suddenly become totally depraved. Each of us, no matter who you are, you don't have to be a Christian. You have divinity. You have divine DNA. And most likely, the biggest part of the Christian journey is realizing that. And that as you realize that, and as you get in touch with that, transformation will take place, because you will ultimately shed the false self and become the true self, which is made in the image of God. And the false self is what culture tells us we need to be, uh, what we do to make sense of this world, to navigate, to be accepted. That's all a false self. It's not necessarily even always a bad self, but it is a false self. The true self is the divine DNA. So we have Jesus Christ as the cornerstone or, and the foundation, everything in the church. Then we have divine DNA. Then we said that God abundantly poured out His grace upon us uh, through His favor, which is, one again, the divine DNA. Uh, it would be the Scriptures that... Uh, what this, the one that He gave us the Scriptures, but also uh, that what the Scriptures are able to do, it's living, it's active, sharper than a double-edged sword. You can read it, you can read it, and it can transform you. You can read it, and it can shake you, it can move you, it can, you can wrestle with it. But it's, again, there's divinity in it, and we have the opportunity to interact with it. There's the Holy Spirit uh, that He has given us, again, uh, poured out, uh, either living in us as Christians, visiting maybe beforehand. Again, we don't know all the details of that, but again, his favor. And then we said, so but these are all building blocks. Okay. Then there is the one that I heard the, got the most feedback on that some are wrestling with, uh, is this idea of personal responsibility. We don't like that one. Okay. Where uh, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, train yourself to be godly. Or the book of Philippians, work out your salvation, your rescue from this world, your rescue from the false self to the true self, if you may. Uh, work it out with, with fear and with trembling. But that ultimately, ultimately my spirituality, my divine union, my relationship with God, uh, my uh, we spoke yesterday in the group, doing spiritually well. When is someone doing spiritually well, not well? And I think we maybe messed a bit with that idea yesterday, and one day we'll do a series on that, uh, uh, messing with, with, with what that is. But ultimately, all of that is my responsibility. Where God comes into the picture with His divine favor as giving us Jesus, giving us the divine DNA, Scripture, uh, the Holy Spirit, but it's then what I do with it will ultimately determine whom I will become and what kind of role uh, I will play in the garden and God's church. <clears throat> then uh, last week we spoke on the idea that in that mix then, what we see happening in Scripture not necessarily commanded that directly, so you can, again, semi-debatable, but the idea of, of people having a, a training partner as a, that every young, and I think people miss me saying that word young, every young Christian needs a training partner. Every young leader needs a training partner. Every young married couple needs training. Every young parent needs training. Whenever I enter a new, new territory or a new phase in my life again, God has given us His grace and abundance with people, but that we, we need an a older, a more mature gardener showing us how to do garden work. We need a more mature gardener who has discovered or been able to um, connect with the divine DNA inside of them to show us how they have done it. 
We need a more mature gardener who has worked through the difficulties of a young marriage and finding each other living in the same home, in the same space, and doing life together, uh, teaching us from their ways how they've done it. And an older, more mature <clears throat> gardener. Now, the classroom will never do this. Meaning, yes, the classroom is required to grow in a knowledge of Scripture and God. Meaning, this is the classroom. Uh, joining a Bible school or Bible college or program or listening to the Bible project or Bema, I know those two are big in our congregation, um, attending ministry training groups and whatever training groups. I forever have heard people say this, oh, this training group, that training group, we must have training groups, and, and I, I believe in training groups. But let me tell you, training groups, the classroom will never be able to train transformatively as walking with someone. So, <clears throat> in Mark 3, verse 13, we look at Jesus, says he appointed 12 that they might be with him. Okay? Uh, that they might be with him. That they might see, sure, he would teach them different things, but that they might observe him. Uh, Luke, uh, Jesus prays, and then the disciples listening to him praying, saying, teach us to pray also. Why? It's what they saw. It's what they heard. It's what they experienced. Constantly people were watching Jesus. The 12 was with Jesus all the time. Um, eight years ago, when uh, we moved back from Johannesburg to year, we started a, a new youth ministry. We asked uh, Alistair and Karen to partner with us. And so hey, uh, they were very willing and eager and did it for eight years, for which we're incredibly thankful. Um, and said, listen, we will, <clears throat> we will teach and train you whatever it is that we have learned so far in our time in the youth ministry in Johannesburg uh, to be able to do this. So you don't have to know anything. We will teach you and train you. So one year later, or whatever it was, I asked Alistair, as he's Yoda at that time, as a young leader, <laughs> what have you learned, uh, young Luke Skywalker? <laughs> <laughs> Although he's like a couple of months younger than me. But in uh, that navigation, of course, and I, I am, when it comes to these things, I um, am a relentless trainer uh, of the young, young leaders, young this, young that. And then he took me by surprise on what he said. I don't know, Alice, if you can recall that. But he didn't say anything about the things that I actually said during those, that year or two. But what he shared he learned was actually by observation. So I said, sure. Uh, what I learned is that at that time, how calmly I navigate bad news. And we never did a lesson on that. <laughs> but it was, and I also learned bad things, which I didn't ask. I wasn't ready for that. Okay. But it was by observation. So doing life with us, he has interacted with me in a number of places where I received bad news. Things didn't go according to plan. Uh, we back then had, had this tenant in a parental property that we had that refused to leave for eight months. Okay? Those kind of things is what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and I was they don't pay and they're not going to leave and they're not going to go anywhere. They're going to kumbaya there in your place. But that most training for the young is actually learned by observation and not in the classroom. It's by walking with you. So, uh, then as I realize it with him, I realize, but it's the same is true for me. As I look back in the rearview mirror of all the trainers I've had, I realize that the most training, the most I learned from these people were actually by observation. Not by why they said, uh, little young Yoda, uh, here's what you should do, ABC, here's what you should consider. No, it's me watching them, me interacting with them, me seeing how they interacted with people, uh, me seeing how they navigated bad news, good news. It's just watching. It's training, training by observation. So we all need that. So as I said, training partner for the young, young Christian, young leader, young married couple, young parent. Here's the question, though, which also causes debate. What is young? And as when do you stop being 
young. Well, I'm like 85 and I'm still as young. <laughs> what is young? What is a, a young Christian? Now, again, you can look at it and say, well, listen, if you get to be a Christian for 60 years, then most probably as a 10-year-old Christian, you're still young. But in what it is that we are talking about, what is a young Christian and that needs this trainer? Can you my take on it, right or wrong? I'm telling you my take. Maximum two years. Maximum two years. I'm not saying you cannot go longer. What I'm saying is it's odd if you do. Or there must be some or the other reason uh, for it uh, if, you, if you do. Because it's one person training the other to do what? Jesus said he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach, to teach. So in other words, that the young Christian, the young married couple, the young whoever, should have a trainer. They're actually training me towards an end. We're building the garden. They are training me so that I can also go and that I can teach. Uh, what I appreciate, I can't remember if I shared it last week, but I appreciate about Gustav and helping me become a Christian 30 years ago is that uh, he helped me and then tried to help me help someone else, even though I wasn't really a disciple yet. Okay, so we, we did Bible study together, and then two weeks later, what I learned from him, I had to teach another guy that also wanted to become a Christian, but so that they can go out and preach, so that they can go out and, and build the garden. So the young needs to be trained to preach, teach the good news of the kingdom, of new creation, of God's rule and reign on earth as is in heaven. If that relationship doesn't change, there's a strange dynamic that will take place. Okay? So we have, this is not going to happen unless we train and someone then goes and multiplies. So we have Jesus Christ, we have divine DNA, we have the Holy Spirit, uh, then we have training part, a training partner. Where to from here? So in other words, after that two-year-ish mark, where to from here? The next step I want to suggest is faithful friends. So for me to, to grow, for us to build a better tomorrow, what we need is faithful friends. Now, another lesson that I've learned from parenting as I've sought counsel from those that are ahead of me in the different areas, the mature gardeners, and I've observed as well as to what they have or have not done, because you can learn from that too by observation, is with the regards to the transition from a teenage child to an adult. And the dynamic of the relationship that needs to change between parent and child as this transition takes place. Now, let me ask this. Who of us, age 30 and above, still have or had parents, if they've passed away, that continue or continued Treating you like a child, even though you were 30, 40, 50, or even 60 years old. Who of us have had parents like that? Okay, just raise your hand a little bit higher. Okay. A number of us. Now, who of us that put up our hands, how many of you felt or is feeling that that really endeared you to them? Again, let's have a show of... Okay, you can put up your hands now. <laughs> Making that transition as a parent, for me as a parent, can be pretty hard, but it has to be done. That is, if you want to see your child succeed in life, and if you want to see your relationship with them and the decades to come succeed as well. Uh, we early on, uh, before our kids even reached that age, uh, age, decided to make that transition, that we will make that transition around about the age of 18, which in retrospect, I would say, for us, is just too late. It needs to be earlier uh, for us. But what, what does that look like for us to make that transition 
with my teenage child into adulthood, as they now for us, like I said, turn 18. Here was a big thing, is that we would not give them any advice unless asked. At all. Now let that... So I mean, they must now 18, they now an adult, their responsibility is their responsibility, and uh, unless they ask, now with that comes other things, they also need to um, take responsibility for the consequences of these decisions that happened that they did not ask advice on. Okay, but that's on them, not on me. But that's a transition that has to take place. I cannot give unsolicited advice to a 19-year-old, 20-year-old, let alone a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old child. They must actually ask for the advice. Now, as I said in the beginning last time, we also look back at these things of when our kids turn age 30, will they be able to answer yes to those questions? I felt love and accepted, I felt prepared for life, whatever, whatever. Then I thought, ooh, what if at age 30 they say, wait a minute, I'm actually upset with you because I think you saw a number of things in my life and you simply didn't say anything about it. So, hmm, okay, that could be a problem. So I decided the best way to resolve that is to ask. So I then went to one of my older children and said, listen here, yes, obviously the decision that we have been doing is that I'm not going to give advice unless you ask for it. And uh, yet, obviously, I'm not blind. I see things, I experience things, and I just wanted to check in with you. I don't want you to feel like I'm disinterested. I'm actually doing this because I want you to be able to lead your own life, and I'm totally available for you, okay, if you need counsel. So, do you want me to give advice when you've not asked for it? And the answer was, no, thank you. I said, hey, appreciate that then. Then they said, is there anything you wanted to say? <laughs> I said, no, 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 not at this moment, <clears throat> not at this moment. Uh, but it's a transition that has to take place. They have to take responsibility. Now, I know, and I'm not going to go into a parenting class. Listen, if, they, if they're stay at home, they're, if they're staying at home into their older years, that's obviously a different dynamic because now you're also the landlord. Okay, one of my kids actually has my phone number saved on their phone as landlord. <laughs> <laughs> And that's Pippa, not the older ones. <laughs> now she's thinking, why, why am I calling her out? I looked on the phone the other day and I was like, landlord? <laughs> okay. uh, it's better than Lisa. Lisa's birth her. <laughs> now she's saying, stop, stop. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yes, you'll always be the parent. You'll always be their mom or their dad. Yes, you will always be, be concerned about them. Someone was telling me the other day where they are 58, and the, the wife was telling me of the husband that's 58. They were going out, and the husband's 58-year-old's husband, as mom said, I to remember to take your jersey. It's cold out there. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, you'll always be the parent, but you must stop parenting. You must transition from being a parent to being a friend and possibly an advisor other than the landlord component, meaning that the landlord is in this house, we do certain things a certain way, we all help out, we all this, that, this, that. This is not advice, this is landlord stuff. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> but you, you must be able to make that transition from being a parent to friend, a possible advisor, uh, if they ask it, as I said, in some cases, landlords. They are their own people, and they must work out their own lives. And truth be told, truth be told, and I've seen this happen before my very eyes as I'm getting older, they will, your children, will most likely outgrow you in several areas. They might even, almost likely will even surpass you in many areas of life, if not all. Through the years, I've seen several parents go wrong with this. And I will most likely, as my kids get older, be tempted to go there too. 
But the more and more I have thought about this over the last decade or so, <clears throat> I have come to realize that this is most probably one of the biggest mistakes that we have made in our fellowship when it comes to what we call discipling relationships. Where we say person A is trainer of person B and will almost be that indefinitely as the years and the decades roll by. So here you have a 22-year-old training a 19-year-old, but 30 years later, this is a 52-year-old training a 49-year-old. And what has most probably happened is that person B, <clears throat> person B has most probably more come alongside, at least in some areas, might even have surpassed in other areas. As with parenting, they will catch up. The people that I train will catch up with me, and in several areas might even surpass me. I've seen this around me uh, with people like James Lapperman, who's out of town, so I cannot nicely talk about him. Uh, I was, how much younger is he than me? About five years? I can't remember. But obviously when he became a Christian back whenever, 20 years ago, he was like, 22, and let's say I'm 27. Now that difference is a lot smaller. And I've seen how he has outgrown me in a number of areas. And then where I've had to realize, for instance, in the areas that he has outgrown me, that when we're in a situation and leadership roles, whatever, that he should rather lead in that area. And we have had settings where we are introducing new ideas to leaders of the church, whatever, where I know he will do a much better job at doing that than me with people's reaction particularly, okay? And then I say, actually, listen here, dude, why don't you do it? You're much better at it than this than me. We are not teacher-student by a long shot. We must make the transition from discipling partner or training partner to what I call, you can give another name for it, faithful friends. What is a faithful friend? A faithful friend, in short, and again, I'm not saying this is my take, a faithful friend is a friend that is faithful both to God and to you. Let's start with the friend part. <laughs> They're actually a friend. <laughs> to be a faithful friend, you have to be a friend, not an acquaintance, a friend. Not I also know you. Not I'm also in the same family group as you. Not I'm also in the same church as you. Not I'm also at the same age bracket than you, same ethnicity than you, whatever. You must actually be a friend. And now the question would be, so what then is a friend? My guess is that would uh, look different to all of us, but I would say, I guess, my guess would be at a very bare minimum, someone whom you love and trust and whom love and who love and trusts you. If I don't love and trust you, and you don't love and trust me, or I love and trust you, but you don't me, or the other way around, I don't think we're friends. There, it must be mutual. That a friend is someone I have sincere interest in you, and you have sincere interest in me. It's mutual. Years ago, I don't know where I heard or read this, I tried to find it but couldn't, is someone asked, how do you know if you are best friends? And the person answered, both parties feel that they are getting the most joy, satisfaction, and benefit from the relationship. Both parties feel it. So if you were to ask friends, good, great friends, who gets, person A, B, who gets the most benefit from this relationship, both of them will say, it's me. I get most from it. That is a friend. Now, some of us might be thinking, I don't just need faithful friends, I actually just need a friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's another sermon series. <clears throat> What do I mean by faithful, faithful friend, both faithful to God, faithful to you? Faithful to God is they have a deep desire of a loving union with the Trinity, God, Father, Son, and joyfully live out their purpose as 
image bearers and garden builders. Okay? So I'm looking for a faithful friend. Their friend, faithful to God, faithful to me. Faithful to God is a deep desire for loving union. Not a deep desire to be the moral police. Not a deep desire to be right. A deep desire to even, not even a deep desire to be moral. A deep desire for a loving union with the Trinity and live out their purpose as an image bearer, as someone that would reflect the divine love into this world and build the garden. What do I mean by faithful to you? Faithful to you would mean that they are what the Bible refers to in the Greek language, a bond servant. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul writes and he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't live for yourself and your arrogance. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Does that remind you of what I said earlier on in a friendship? In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. So in others, sure, I'm equal with God, I am divine, I have all of this, I'm not going to use this divinity for me. Rather, he made himself nothing, he poured himself out, by taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. The very nature of, took on the very nature of a servant. That word servant there is doulos, which in the Greek is, it's a bond servant. Who took on, Jesus took on the very nature of a servant, of a doulos, a bond servant, where he said, I'm not going to use whatever God has given me, allow me to have for my own advantage. I'm going to use it. I'm going to bond myself to you. The Bible even talks about, obviously, covenant relationships. I'm going to bond myself to you, use what I have been given towards your advantage. Which, in our case, what we're saying is what we want is we want to be able to get in touch with the divine DNA image that's inside of me. So if you are a friend that is faithful to God and you're faithful to me, then what you will be doing is that you will be using whatever God has given you in service of me and helping me to get in touch with the divine DNA, reflect the image and be a garden builder. But it's mutual. There is a mutual interest. We are faithful friends. And so in the same way, what I have is I am also your bond servant. I'm also bonding myself to you. I'm making a pact with you saying that as friends, I would love to play this role in your life too. To be faithful friends means that you actively live out the love, support, encouragement that the scriptures call us to share with one another, creating deep transformative relationships. This is where we see where we have historically spoken about a lot, the one another scriptures and each other scriptures in the Bible. Paul says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Jesus is teaching what he showed us about God. As you teach and admonish one another, this is not a teacher-student relationship. This is not for the young. The young is a student. The young takes out the notepad, and the teacher, those, the more mature gardener, helps them. Where you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Romans 15. I myself am convinced, brothers and sisters, that you yourself are full of goodness, divine DNA, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Romans 12. Be devoted to one another. It's not the teacher that is devoted to the benefit of the student to the, te- uh, to the student. No, this is a one another relationship where we are devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. One another. It's not just me doing the work. It's not just you doing the work. We are both doing the work. 
we have bonded ourselves to each other. Be kind and compassionate to one another, not just me to you, not just you to me, but to one another, forgiving who each other, just as Christ forgave you. Therefore, 1 Thessalonians 5, encourage one another. If we are faithful friends, who needs to be doing the encouraging? Both of us. Encourage one another and build each other up. Who should be doing the building? Both of us. Because we are friends. We are faithful friends. I love and trust you. You love and trust me. I have a sincere interest in you. You have a sincere interest in me. I am faithful to God and His divinity inside of me, what that means and how I should live it. And I'm faithful to you to do the same. And we are making a pact and we are bonding each other. This is where the rubber meets the road. And my guess is that this is where we as a fellowship have fallen short. We have either not made the transition from student, teacher to faithful friends, or even worse, we've just become friends. So we're friends, and we've been friends for 30 years, but we are not faithful friends to each other, encouraging each other, building each other, teaching each other, instructing one another. I'm incredibly grateful for faithful friends in my life. I think of uh, Temba Kulu. I had lunch with him again this week. He now lives in um, Durban or just outside of Durban. Uh, we have been faithful friends now for many years. Uh, and in all honesty, it was something that I had to decide to do 10 years ago. I realized I needed faithful friends. <laughs> And basically, almost, I didn't approach him, I sneaked it in. I thought, man, dude, I'm, I'm going to be your faithful friend, and I hope you'll do the same for me. I never said it, I just hoped for it. Okay, it took two years for us to get to that point, and we've speak, spoken about it publicly, where he didn't necessarily in the beginning trust my faithfulness. <laughs> uh, to him, he thought, man, this guy's coming with some form of agenda. There was no agenda. We were not in a discipling relationship, we've never been. I, I knew I needed faithful friends, and I thought this dude will most likely also need me. Man, I thank God for that and should be thanking God every day. We, both of us, have been going through a difficult time in our faith in many ways for a number of years, four or five years. And there's a season in these four or five years where we literally spoke every day for almost two to three years without living in the same time. Every day for almost two to three years. And we would encourage each other. We would call each other out. We would lament with each other. <laughs> We would call each other out on the lament if it required calling out. We would call each other out when we were losing our way. In other words, where I would say something, think something, oh, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that, and whether it is with Lisa or anyone else, it's, mm, I appreciate that, I hear that, but you would be a concern for me. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? He last year, I was about to make a very silly decision and randomly thought, hey, let me, let me check in with him, talking this, that, this, that. I'm saying, hey, I'm thinking about making this decision. And he said, whoa, I wouldn't do that if I were you. It wasn't a sinful decision that I was planning to make, but certainly something that would not have worked out well. I thank God for him. I thank God that he was there to, to say, hey, hold on, brother. We have no official responsibility with each other. Again, in our lunch this week, same thing. We are talking. We are sharing. We're saying, how's it going? We're encouraging. We're uplifting. We're helping. We are faithful friends. Uh, uh, Karen has been a faithful friend to me in many ways in the, uh, in the church office earlier. I think it was earlier this year. She said, you know what? I've come to realize that I just don't enjoy working with you anymore. You have become grumpy, anxious, and difficult, in all honesty. <laughs> it was true. I had to walk away from that and say, sure. That's true. Poor her. That can't be fun. Faithful. 
friends, looking out for each other. We will not be able to move forward as a church and go where we need to go unless we are faithful friends, unless we get this right. I think early this year or late last year, Again, James, another faithful friend. And I have many faithful friends. If I don't mention it today, I can't mention all. But these are just things that popped up in my head as I thought about this. Um, James and I have been faithful friends, I think, also for, for many years. We have not been in any form of discipling a relationship for over a decade. Uh, and yet we are constantly uh, in each other's lives. And I think last year, there was something, again, we were both part of something that was becoming very complicated. Uh, and needed an enormous amount of wisdom, counsel, for a, a boatload of things. And uh, he, he said some, he shared concerns that he had for me with regards to this matter. And uh, I thought more about it, and I also had concerns for him uh, with regard to this matter. It wasn't a ping pong tit for tat, it was, it was real. But so literally, we, we, set, we set up time to have coffee uh, at Kira, up at Alchemy. Man, it was hectic. So... We're sitting down, and I, I know what's going to go down here in terms of I know this is going to be a pretty intense conversation for both of us. It's going to hurt. Uh, tears will be shed, most likely by me. Uh, and uh, so I said this. I said, listen, um, I think both of us know that we're going to have a pretty intense conversation right now. <laughs> and so what I want to ask you is, do you feel like our friendship can sustain it before we have it? So in other words, whatever it is that's going to be said here today by you, by me, because we both have things in our heart that we need to work through, do you think our friendship can sustain it? Can we, are we good enough friends that we can walk away from this conversation, and although no matter what was said, no matter how true or brutal or hurtful it was, that we're going to be okay? We're going to be okay as friends, and that we will not give each other the evil eye, we will not now avoid each other in the fellowship or whatever. I said, no, be in. Uh, he said, what about you? Uh, I said, I think so too. I'm in. So let the games begin. Uh, and then, man, we had a, like, like I said, many tears were shed mostly, unless he cried inwardly, mostly by me. Maybe it was just me. I think it was just me. <clears throat> it was brutal. It took me like weeks to recover. <laughs> Emotion, I think him too. But it didn't change the nature of our relationship. Both of us, we were, try and both, uh, the discussion had to do not with our friendship. The discussion had to do with our faith and how we are navigating different scenarios in our life. It's a faithful friend. He's a faithful friend to me, and I hope and pray that I am a faithful friend to him. I want to ask you, dear brother or sister, if you are beyond the two year mark, who are your faithful friends? I'm not talking about people that have grown old with you in the church that are your friends. We've got plenty of them. I'm talking about faithful friends. Faithful. Faithful to God. Faithful to you. The kind of friend that doesn't explain away your behavior. You know, and I know this has been said of me, and rightly so, but it's a problem my faithful friends need to tell me. When they say, oh, that's just Werner. You know, do you have a friend like that? We say, oh, no, no, don't worry. They, oh, no, no, they, oh, but they're very manipulative. Oh, that's just them. Oh, they're very insecure. They're always right. They're always the moral police, whatever. Oh, that's just them. Oh, that's just them. You don't say that of a faithful friend. You don't say of a faithful friend, that's just them. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a safe space. There should be safe space, and we should accept one another. But remember when we spoke about self-awareness and what self-awareness is? Self-awareness is having an awareness of how my habitual, predictable ways of thinking, feeling, acting, and doing serves or defeats my relationships, my relationship with God and others. And so if there is just a thing that is just Werner that is defeating my relationship with God and others, I need a faithful friend to tell me so. Again, faithful friend. Someone whom I love and trust and love and trust me. So they're not just random Joe moral policeman who feels like they want to get their nose in my business. A faithful friend. Whose responsibility is it to have faithful friends? It's my responsibility to have faithful friends. 
when I need to make big decisions in my life, and I, I need counsel, I need help, I need people who, again, love and trust me, knows who I am, can help me. Is this a wise decision or not? Faithful friends. Faithful friends love and trust each other. Faithful friends help you build your strengths. Faithful friends help each other overcome or at least navigate weakness. Faithful friends keep each other sharp and nimble spiritually. Faithful friends. How do we build this? Faithful friends. Let's not pretend to be faithful friends when we are not. Let's rather be honest and say, you know what, you and I are friends, but not faithful friends. Let's not pretend to be the trainer of someone for 30 years, <laughs> but rather realize that we're missing something and that our growth and forward movement, I believe, depends on this. How do we build this? Jesus Christ. Foundation. Realize, I have, I'm not inherently evil. It's not God and Spirit, there's vanner. <laughs> okay, what did the psalmist say? Fearfully and wonderfully made. Divine DNA. That has challenges, but divine DNA. Be in the Scripture. Engage with the Holy Spirit. Realize that it's my responsibility. When you're young, get a trainer, but then on top, after the trainer, get a faithful friend. Whose responsibility? Your responsibility. Let's build faithful friendships. God bless. Amen.